Thank you, First Lady, who is on Zoom. Uh, Let Us Pray is the name of our sermon series. And it's a sermon series about prayer. Like we, we've been talking about prayer. And how do we define prayer a few weeks ago? Can anybody give me that? How do we define prayer? What do we say that, that prayer is? Yes, communing and communicating with God. So it's being with God, it's being in relationship with God, just kind of being with him. Uh, We told the story about Mary and Martha yesterday. So what did Mary do? She's sitting at the feet of God, right? She's kind of communing with him. And we all have an opportunity to do that. One of the ways that we do that is through just sitting in silence. We talked about silent prayer and, and just being in the presence of God. But then there's also communicating with God. Uh, So that's when we actually say to God, God, I need this. I want this. I have to have this. God, save me from this. This is communicating with God. So prayer is both communing and communicating. Today, we'll we'll talk about, we'll kind of be more on the communicating side, but we'll, we'll have some communing as well, because we are talking about something I get excited about, which is what some people call corporate prayer. Uh, other people call it um, a prayer in unison or, or uh, a prayer that is for everybody, prayer that's for the entire church. The language that I want to give us for this morning is actually prayer in concert, prayer in concert. So that's what we'll talk about. And the name of the message is praying together. So if you have Bibles, uh, I think we'll have it on the screen as well. You can go ahead and meet me in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, and we'll start at verse 6, and we'll actually go all the way to verse 18. Acts chapter 12, verse 6 through 18. And as we read this, we'll see how Jesus, through the text, gives us an example of how we should be praying together. Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 18. I got to hold it close because I forgot to put my glasses on. It says this. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared And a light shone in the cell, striking Peter on the side. He woke him up and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did. He wrapped, or wrap your cloak around you, the angel told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know that what the angel did was really happening. But he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. Verse 11, when when Peter came to himself... He said, no, I know. I love that right there. Now, I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door of the outer gate, and a servant named Rhoda came to an answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing out the outer gate. You're out of your mind, they told her, but she kept insisting that it was true, and they said it is his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. Verse 17, motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. 
tell these things to James and the brothers, he said, and he left and went to another place. I want to read verse 18 too. At daylight, there was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. Let me pray over the word of God. Father, we thank you. We know that your word is truth. We need that truth. We know that even in a story like this, as we talked about miracles earlier, we know that even in a story like this, there's a lesson for our lives. So we pray right now, Holy Spirit, lead us. Lead us as we walk through the scriptures. We thank you for these things that are true. And we pray that we can apply them to our lives so that we can continually live in truth. And we pray these things and many more in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen and amen. So um, many of you know this, but I graduated from Bethune-Cookman University, the great Bethune-Cookman University. I had to add that. The great Bethune-Cookman University. If you don't know where that is, if you walk out this door and look to your left, that's the school right there. And one of the uh, things that's very important for Bethune-Cookman University is this game that we play every year against Florida A&M University. It's called the Florida Classic. Anybody heard the Florida Classic? Well, you heard of it now. It's a game between two rivals, Bethune-Cookman and Florida A&M University, and we've been playing this game for several years. It takes place in Orlando, and I was in the band when I was uh, at Bethune-Cookman University. So the, the, the marker of how important the season is it falls on the Florida Classic. This is the most important game of the season, not just for the football team, but, but for the band as well. Like the band has to make sure that we have the most precise show that we can have. We have to make sure the dance moves are on point. I was a drum major, so you had to make sure you could do that little back bend thing and go all the way back without falling. This is important to us. And every year we work week in and week out on creating the greatest show we can come up with. And a lot of people believe that in the Florida Classic, for our halftime show, the best part of it is the dance routine. Uh, for some of y'all who don't know what a dance routine is, at the end, I'm not going to do it. See, I looked at your eyes, you're like, are you going to do it? I'm not going to do a dance routine. But at the end, there's a dance routine where we collect a few songs that are popular, and we do those songs, and we have uh, cool hip dances to go with it, and it's very exciting. But to a real musician... The greatest part of the show is not the dance routine. The greatest part of the show is what we call the concert number. See, the concert number is the only time in the show where we are completely still, where the only thing we focus on is musicianship. When we start the show, we're, we're drilling around, we're marching, we're going in circles and making shapes. At the end of the show, we're dancing, we're doing all these moves, but in the concert number, you hear, you hear all the details of what we've been working on. You hear the dynamics of going up and down in the music. And one of the most important parts of the concert number is that if someone is out of tune, if someone is out of timing, if someone is not on point, you can tell it because nobody else is moving. It's important. Matter of fact, uh, the, my favorite song that we play for the concert number is a, a song called Stairway to Heaven. Not the one, not the rock and roll version. Uh, Stairway to Heaven by a group named the OJs, right? And, and we, we start off this song, and it starts with a three count. And on that fourth count, everybody comes in in unison. It's the, the concert number that shows the unity of the band the most, because we actually have to concentrate on striking together and moving together. It is the place where unity, consistency, and power all come together. See, for the church, a lot of people want to run to the place where you see the shapes and the drill and, and it's exciting. There's movement. A lot of people get excited about, quote unquote, dance routines in the church, whether that be through worship or, or through um, things that we do that are cool and hip. All of those things are important. But nothing displays the unity, 
consistency and the power of a church, like a concerted effort to strike together in prayer. See, we need to be praying together. All of us need to be praying together. If we all have our own private lives, that is good and well. But there's something special that happens when the church comes together to pray together. The most powerful movements of a church come from a consistent and collective use of force through prayer. If you think through church history, you can see how every move that's ever happened, every reform that's ever happened, every major movement in church history has come by prayer. There's a man I talk about fairly often here. Uh, His name is C.H. Spurgeon. Um, I saw Nikki post it earlier in the week. His name is The Spurge. That's his nickname. Uh, That's what what people who are familiar with him call him. But Spurgeon was what they called the prince of preachers. He's the most dynamic preacher uh, that, that existed in that day. There were thousands of people who would travel to come hear uh, Spurgeon preach. And he would do tours of his church, which is one of the biggest churches around at that moment in history. And what he would tell every single person who asked about why this church had as much power as it did, or why he could preach as well as he did, he would lead them to this little prayer room in the basement, which he called the powerhouse of the church. And every single time he preached, there were dozens, some say hundreds of people down there praying together. C.H. Spurgeon knew that there's nothing that can happen that's special with the church without people praying. And what's funny is we operate as if we can't go without worship. Or we operate as if we can't go without someone who's a dynamic preacher. But how many times have we said to ourselves, I am okay going to this church because they have a dynamic prayer life. That I know that the people are praying. And not just uh, collecting their homework like your kids do and come do it, go do it somewhere else. But actually praying together, a people who are saying that they are going to uh, collect all of their amens and put them together so that they can see God move in a dynamic way. Praying to God with showers of amen that accompany the high notes of the person who is leading. These are the movements that we see in a praying church. This is, is something that we've moved away from in many places. That church order or polity or brevity of a worship service. We need to get in at 11 and out by 12 so the prayers can't be too long. Uh, Embracing some traditions that have made us clean and orderly, but they've pulled us away from that moment where we just sit in prayer. Praying together with power, though, is more ancient than any of these things. It's more ancient than the pulpit. It's more ancient than the liturgy. Praying together with power is actually how the church became to be. That is how it came to be, is through a prayer meeting. Prayer is the most ancient thing that we can do as a church. And I have to be honest. I'm more inclined to believe that when Jesus prayed with his disciples, it was far less like a man speaking slowly and calmly while everyone else just listened. I think it was probably more like a collective experience. Whereas Jesus prayed to the father, uh, his disciples came along with him and amen him and championed him and prayed in concert with him like a symphony of voices being led by the main voice of God himself. Do we look at prayer in that way? Or do we make prayer one of those things that whoever has the microphone or whoever's asked, that's the person who gets to pray and we just sit there and listen? I don't know if that's how Jesus wants us to look at prayer. That's what every time a prayer should look like. It should look like a symphony of voices being led by the main voice of God himself through the spirit. Have y'all ever seen um, Jewish people pray? 
Have you ever been to a synagogue or, or a place where there are, are Jews who pray together? It's not calm at all. It's not quiet. It's not like this room right now where you can hear a pin drop. There are multiple voices. There's melody in their prayers. I mean, even the Psalms that we read calmly, they sing through their praying. It's concert style. It's a symphony of voices coming together with melodic rhythms moving through the airways up towards the heavenlies. See, some of us would get distracted by that. Some of us, if, if I was praying right now and someone else is praying in the background and, and three or four of us are saying amen or thank you, Jesus, or, or Lord, yes, some of us would get distracted. But again, I think this is a lot more of how Jesus prayed. And if we were in any of the prayer meetings of the first and second century, we would likely hear these same things. What I think is missing from a lot of churches today is the church coming together in power and praying together. No grab and go prayers, no homework prayers, but prayers in concert. Like the teacher said, we are doing the work here. This is the greatest group project we can do is to pray together. There's a denomination called the Church of God in Christ. Anybody heard of that? The Church of God in Christ is this a Pentecostal denomination, more of a charismatic denomination, but they have a foundation on the tradition of prayer. And they, they root their foundation in the fact that it's a predominantly black uh, denomination. And they talk about the fact that when the slave ships were coming over, that there were plenty of voices uh, praying at the same time, that they had no ability to go to corners or, or to separate or listen to one voice. But all of these voices are working together in concert. And that tradition moved over. So as it went from the slave ship to what's called invisible, assemblies, which are simply uh, the churches that were organized on plantations, that they would go out into the field and have church together, and they would call these invisible assemblies on the plantations. And then it eventually went to what we call the church house. They, they built these small church houses, and they would say that you could hear them praying from miles away in the church house because they didn't feel like it was necessary to separate out who was praying when or who could take this thing or that thing. They were praying together. And the church of God in Christ would carry that tradition on into the 20th century. The church of God in Christ was started by a man named Charles Harrison Mason. Charles Harrison Mason. Google that. Uh, he was a former slave that believed in the power of God from a young age. In his 30s, he visited the Azusa Street Mission, which is what some people call the birth of Pentecostalism, especially in America. And the thing that he got most from them was not running around the building or, or, or using snakes in worship or speaking in tongues. The thing that he got most from them was spending time praying together corporately, fervent corporate prayer. And Mason saw the power in prayer and he adopted that practice and he named it prayer in concert. Just like the notes of a concert number that are played by a marching band, the tones and the melodies that are prayed in concert are a marker of how strong the collective prayer life of a church actually is. Get this point. Prayer in concert is power on display in a church with life. If you're looking for a church that actually has life, it doesn't come with a guy out front jumping down, up and down on stage. It doesn't come with me being as dynamic as I can or, or me coming up with the greatest sermons ever, the greatest sign of life in a church. is how much that church prays. Throughout history, we've seen that. And this isn't a, a practice that was thought up lately. This is a practice, this is biblical. The book of Acts describes prayer rooms. The book of Acts describes uh, prayer being like a training ground uh, for battle. The book of Acts it talks about the first century being outlined by prayer. Let's look at some scripture because we are a Bible-based church and I hope we're going to be a praying church too. 
But Acts 1.14 it shows us right there that they were continually united in worship. No, prayer. That they were united in prayer. If we look at Acts 2.42, this is a passage that a lot of people run to and say, this is the perfect picture of a church. But what does it say? That they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to what? Prayer. Devoted, They gave their life up for it, that they were actually sacrificing their comfort for it, that this is something that they said, hey, you know what? I can go without this. I can go without that, but I cannot go without prayer. Acts 4.31, it says, when they had prayed, let me read that again. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Let me take a little second to do a commercial break. In the new year, we're going to start a series called Bold. It's going to be in the book of Acts. And guess what we'll talk about for like the first month and a half? Prayer. Because this is what we see, especially in the first four chapters of Acts. The early church believed in one thing for sure and one thing for certain that prayer was absolutely necessary and praying together was necessary for the church. Praying alone can be hard. I can admit that. A lot, of, some of us have problems just praying, period. And getting together is hard, right? Like if it's so easy to get together, this room would be packed right now. But praying together doesn't give us extra credit points if we're able to break through that barrier. It is simply us saying that we're willing to break through some of the harder things so that we can support each other in prayer. Something special happens when God's people get together, they gather together around prayer. Think about prayer meetings. You see that in Acts. You think about prayer rooms. That sounds a little excessive for some churches, but that's in the book of Acts. Uh, if I told everybody that we have midday prayer, how many people in here would show up? I don't know, but, but this is what we see in the Bible. These are not new, innovative things. These are ancient practices that the church grabbed hold to. It's amazing to me how many of us churches want to push to be biblical, but we'll push right past something that's a pillar in the building of a church, especially for the first two centuries. And in a society that celebrates individuality, it celebrates us getting together in silos or being adjoined with others to do something that doesn't directly give us a personal return on investment doesn't seem useful, does it? Matter of fact, when, when we are able to go to some prayer meetings or get together in prayer, some of us are waiting for an opportunity just to share our request so that we can ensure that our request is prayed for. How many times do you just say, man, I want to I wanna be with other believers in prayer, not for me. Not for me, but for us, for the collective body. We'd much rather push people into their prayer closets than open up a prayer room. And both are good. Jesus says that we should have closets that we pray in. But, but he also gives us the examples of us getting together in prayer. But when the church prays in concert, God uses our unity to edify, to glorify, and to magnify his power in our lives. So I've done a lot of talking. Let's go to the text so we can see exactly how to do this. Acts 12 gives us a wonderful example of how the church can always be involved in seeing God perform miracles. I didn't even know Kimyata was going to start us off with miracles. And the first way that I can usher us into that is point number one. A praying church has hope in the valley of death. The praying church has hope in a valley of death. All of that pomp and circumstance in my first point mentions death. Well, why? It's because it's the only thing besides IRS getting their taxes that we can count on. 
that at some point, every single one of us has to go. If we believe in Jesus, we'll have eternal life. It's only our bodies going into rest. But, but we know that death happens. And at the point where it happens, in us thinking about it happening, we can at least have hope because of prayer. Look at the text. If we go to uh, Acts 12, Acts 12 starts off with death. It starts off with death. There are three men, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John are like the leaders of the church movement as Jesus has gone and ascended to heaven. These three who spend a lot of time with Jesus while he's alive, they're able to help lead the church, especially in the early days. And Peter and John's ministry was put on display in Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you don't aren't familiar with it, Peter and John, they go to the temple for prayer. And the Holy Spirit is falling upon them. And, and people are saying, man, these guys must be drunk. Like, what are they What are they doing? Like, why are they moving this way? This, it literally says this in the Bible. It says, are they drunketh at this hour? And Peter says, we are not drunk as you suppose. And he begins to introduced him to actually what the gospel message is. And as they do that, they do that on the way to pray. James, who is John's brother, is just as important, though. And as they are going on to do these things, James is uh, with the church and ensuring that the church is living itself out in the way that it's supposed to go. Well, James, being a part of Jesus's inner circle, he understands how important it is to pray. Mark chapter 5, this is quick. Uh, it shows that James is in the inner circle. It says he did not uh, let anyone accompany him except for Peter, James, and John, or Peter, James, and John, James's brother. Matthew 17 and 1, it gives us another example. Peter, James, and John were, were together. They went to a high mountaintop. I share all of these things because in Acts 12, it signifies a shift happening in the church where death becomes more of a regular sign of what it means to, believe, to be a believer than anything. The bitter note that starts Acts 12 starts in Acts 12, verse 1 and 2. You see it. It says this. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. Persecution is coming on the church at this time. And then verse two, it says, and he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. Acts 12 starts with death. The, the, the church is literally being hunted by Herod. And as James dies, Peter is captured and he's facing the same thing. That Peter is likely on his way to dying too. Look at verse 3 and 4, Acts chapter 12. It says this, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too during the festival of unleavened bread. After the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned two, four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after Passover. They were going to treat Peter the same way they treated Jesus. This was Herod's plan. Peter is surely on his way to death. How do, you, how do you feel when you know that the enemy is coming after you? Like when you know that the enemy is after you, he wants you dead. The Bible says that the enemy is here to steal, kill, and destroy. And we go through periods in life, maybe some people on Zoom would say amen, uh, where we feel like the enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying things in our life. Uh, when we're in those times, we feel fear. We don't know what's next. We don't know if it's our time. Sometimes we feel worried. We don't, we don't know how to process through whatever the reality is of the situation. This is surely how Peter must have felt. When he's in a jail cell, he, he, he doesn't have a time of day where he could go to the phone and call everybody else to see what's going on and to see if they can bail him out. No, he's sitting there waiting for death. And how do you think the church felt? How do you think it, it, it felt to be Peter's friend, to be Peter's church member, to be uh, his buddy, his, his prayer partner at that moment? How do you think it felt? And what would you do in that moment? Like when you're under spiritual attack, you can see that your enemy wants you 
what do you do? What do you run to? Whatever you run to at that moment signifies what you believe in. I can't lie to you. When I'm under stress, guess what I run to? Cookies. That's what I run to. Cookies. <laughs> I'm on this kick right now. Chocolate chip cookies, soft bake. When I am stressed, I tell people this all the time. I told Will this a while ago. If you see me gaining weight, you know there's some stress there. Cookies is what I run to. But what that says about me is that I feel like when I'm in trouble, the person who has control or is losing control is me. So I have to feed myself to, to make me feel better. What I really should run to is something that points me back to Jesus. And this is what the church ran to. Because when Peter gets arrested, what does the church do? They stay together and pray. Look at verse five. It says, so when Peter was kept in prison, the church was praying fervently for him. I don't know how many things you've done in your life fervently. <laughs> I don't know how many times you've been in your life and you're like, I have to do this fervently. I had to get this weight off, so I'm working out fervently. <laughs> I had to work through these finances. I had to make sure my budget is worked through fervently. They are fervently working through prayer, which means to me that they didn't stop. That the, every day they sat and they prayed and they prayed hard because they wanted Peter to be released from whatever was going on with them. I wish we would get to the point where we did more things as a church fervently. Where there's passion, there's deep belief and there's uh, deep obedience and continually going back never to stop based off of our own desires. A cookie shouldn't stop me from running to the Lord. And whatever your thing is should not stop you. You should be running fervently in prayer. The church in Jerusalem had hope that Peter would make it out. I know that because whatever you do fervently, you don't do it without hope. I mean, if I work out twice a day every day, it's because I hope that I'll get smaller. <laughs> It's because I, I have some sort of hope there. Because if I did not have hope, I would not do it. The church prayed fervently because even though they had just seen James die, they believed that Peter could be freed. The way that we can display our belief in God and our hope in hard places is through fervent prayer. Coretta Scott King the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King, she said this when someone interviewed her to talk to her about prayer. She says prayer was a wellspring of strength and inspiration during the civil rights movement. Throughout the movement, we prayed for greater human understanding. We prayed for the safety of our compatriots uh, or our compadres in the freedom struggle. We prayed for victory in our nonviolent protests. We prayed for brotherhood and sisterhood amongst peoples of all races, for reconciliation, the fulfillment of a beloved community. They prayed fervently in the darkest of hours. It's prayer that gives hope. Identity Church, I, I hope Identity Church will be known as a church that prays, a church that not just prays, but prays together before, during, and after some of our darkest hours. Before death, during death and after death, before the loss of job, during the loss of job, after the loss of God. I, I hope that we are known as a church that prays together. Not because we believe in ourselves, but because we have hope that God can actually perform miracles. The second thing we can get from Acts chapter 12 when it comes to corporate prayer is a praying church will be surprised by God's hand. A praying church will be surprised by God's hand. Not because we don't believe that it can happen, right? Anything that we pray for, I think deep down inside, we believe that it can happen. But I believe that the way God moves and works on the, the people of God who are praying together is by surprising them. 
If you look at what we see in the text, Peter was surprised. We know Peter was surprised because it says in verse six and seven that as Peter is in this jail, he's woken up in the middle of the night because an angel pokes him. Like, how crazy is that? It, it, it says that the chains fell off uh, right there and suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared and the light shone in the cell and, and the angel said, come on, man. And what does it say? Peter woke up. Peter is asleep. And here's an angel coming to deliver him. He said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. And then look, Peter is still Surprised because look at verse 11. It says, when Peter came to himself, which means that Peter was out of his mind. It says earlier that Peter thought this was a vision. I, I've seen people in my own household. I'm not going to call them out, but I've seen people in the middle of the night do things, sleepwalking, and they don't realize that this is reality. This is where Peter is. So when he comes to himself, he says, now, I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod as Herod's grasp and from all of the Jewish people. Peter was surprised, but he wasn't the only person who was surprised, was he? No, Rhoda was surprised, too. Not Rhonda. Rhoda is her name. Verse 12 through 15. I can't imagine being Peter at this moment. Peter comes to the house, which let me stop right there and say, isn't it beautiful that they were working together in prayer in somebody's house? They didn't wait for the deacon to open up the church building. They didn't wait for a, a, an event to be planned. That they were together in someone's house, Mary's house, praying. And as they are praying, I imagine that Peter, as he's walking up, can hear the prayers of his people from the outside of the house. And Peter goes up to the house and I don't know how he does it, but I, I feel like since Herod's looking for him, he probably has his back to the door and hits one of these really quickly so that people can hear him. But he can look out to make sure Herod's not after him or the soldiers are after him. Or maybe he goes to the back door and he knocks on that back door and he probably knocks pretty loud so that they can hear him. But I imagine that they are praying so fervently that they can't even hear Peter's knocking. But all of a sudden, a servant named Rhoda comes and answers the door. And as she answers the door, the Bible says she recognized Peter's voice. Now, I would make a joke about Peter's voice, but I won't. But I, I think what's interesting about this particular thing is how she reacted because Rhoda was surprised. Rhoda hears Peter's voice and jumps for joy, doesn't open the door, but runs back to the prayer room and says, y'all ain't going to believe this. Y'all don't know who's at the door. And, and they are surprised too, which is what I'll go into in verses 16 and 17. We know that they are surprised because they said, no, 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 that can't be Peter. Matter of fact, they had already counted Peter as dead. Let me stop right here and just say, do you know how serious of a church you must be in where they think that they, th there's a great possibility that you're dead and they keep praying? I mean, if you just saw uh, the spirit of God bring Jesus out of a tomb, Lazarus out of his death, and all of these miracles happening, they probably didn't stop when they thought that Peter was dead. They probably kept going. They said it can't be Peter. He must have already did it. He must have already died and his angel is here. Well, I was like, no, I tell y'all, this is Peter. So then they finally opened the door and they saw him and the Bible says they were what? amazed that even in our prayers with firm belief that God will move with firm belief that God will make something happen there is no match for God's miracles like when God moves when his hand moves he always does it in such a way where it surprises us not shocks us 
To be shocked means that you have fear about it. But to be surprised means that you have excitement, exuberance, joy about it. And this is what happened to Peter when he was unlocked from those chains. Rhoda, when she heard his voice, uh, the, the prayer room, when they saw his face, they were surprised by the moving of God. And when we step out in faith together through prayer, we do so with the hope of the impossible happening, not individually, but collectively. When we don't do that, when we don't do that, we are not even making room to be surprised by God's miracles. A friend of mine and a mentor of mine, his name is John Anwuchekwa. Actually, his book is that orange book uh, back there in the back. Y'all can check it out if you ever have a chance. But he, he wrote a book called Prayer. This is simply called Prayer. And in it, he says this. We won't consistently pray if we're not sure of God's ability. So much of our failure to pray comes from subtly believing that within God exists the possibility of failure. Because of this, we never ask God to do the impossible. Instead, we pursue only the things that we can accomplish on our own. We don't ask, seek, and knock. We don't go to God thinking that he can actually do the impossible. We just go to God thinking, let me give him something that I know he can accomplish. I know John and, and weeks before they launched their church about seven years ago, John's brother passed away unexpectedly in a car in Memphis, Tennessee. He was working at the same church that I, I worked at in Memphis. Weeks after that, there were several people who died in the church. Actually, for about a year, there were several tragedies in that church. And yet, before they ever had a church service, they had a prayer meeting. That a year and a half before they ever met to do anything as a church, they committed themselves that once every month we will pray together. So when tragedy struck, just as it did with James, with uh, uh, Acts chapter 12, or what they thought could have happened to Peter in Acts chapter 12, when tragedy struck, not only were they prepared because they had prayed together, but they were more closely knit together because of their prayers together. And they were surprised by the grace of God and the miracles that he did in keeping them through that period. They were rooted in a rhythm of prayer together that would empower them and put them in a place to be surprised by the hand of God moving on their church. There's one last point I want to give us from the text. It's this, point number three. A praying church is able to thrive in any season. Acts 12 starts off with death. James, a leader in the church, died. Acts 12 moves on, and in verse 20, it has death. Herod, who is the leader of the Jews, uh, he is the one that is appointed by the Roman government, and he's also the one who's causing havoc on the church. Herod dies. Not to mention that, but the guards that were watching Peter before Herod dies, they die. Death all through this chapter. And yet, the thing that the Spirit of God wants us to see is the consistency in the prayer life of the church. <laughs> that with James dying and with Herod dying and the guards dying, you know what did not die? The church. Because they were fervently praying, not to their earthly leader or to a leader of a government, but to their heavenly leader. They were in agreement together. There was prophecy happening amongst their gathering. There was collective intercession together. This is what we see that the church survived because of prayer. In any season, whether it's good, Acts chapter 2, whether it's 
bad, Acts chapter 8, whether it gets even worse, Acts chapter 12, whether we go to the end of the book of Acts where, where Paul dies as well or, or he is leading to his death. Uh, it's always good seasons and bad seasons, good things happening and bad things happening. But what will keep a church afloat, good or bad, is consistent collective prayer. You might be asking me, so how do we do this? How do we, how do we pray just like we see them pray in the Bible? There are a few things I want us to grab hold to. Practical things. As a church, I think we need a prayer meeting. I think we need to go back old school prayer meeting once a month. Once a month, we get together and say, look, I am willing to put anything to the side for this. That I am committed to this, that we all get together, as many of us as possible, we pack this room out and we pray together. Another thing I think is extremely practical is midday prayer. I mean, there, there are traditions that have done this and then people have gotten so busy in their life that they say, I don't have time to go somewhere for midday prayer. And yet in the Bible, uh, Peter and John were on their way to pray. <laughs> whenever they got uh, uh, confronted by the angry religious leaders, that many times people are on their way to prayer, whether it's in the day, in the midday, or at night. The part of the vision for the connect is that every day we would have an hour of silence and prayer. That whoever wants to walk in from the streets, whoever wants to walk in from the church can come here and we pray together. We need to institute midday prayer. Another thing is prayer walks. We've done prayer walks. Matter of fact, I go prayer walking every Thursday at 830. Uh, I've been slacking a little bit. I don't want nobody to uh, call me out. My wife is on there. Uh, but, but Thursdays at 830 are a special time for me. That map that's up there, I walk that route. And I pray. And as I'm praying, I'm also praying for a day where there's 20 of us, 30 of us, 50 people coming together to pray in concert, the melodies of our hearts all striking at one time. Another thing that we have to do is make prayer a priority. Is prayer a priority in your life? Is this something you say, I cannot miss this? I mean, I think about all of the letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote, and I don't think there's one that does not mention Paul asking them to pray for him. Like Paul is coming to all of them and saying, hey, here are all these things that y'all need to know. Here's what's going on with these missionaries. Oh, and yeah, don't forget to pray for me. Don't forget to pray for yourselves. Don't forget to pray for other people because it was absolutely necessary. It was a priority. We also have to learn how to be more present. Like in this day and age, we feel like, hey, they're not going to miss me on this day. They, you know, things will go on without me on this day. And life happens. It does. But we should be more inclined to be present than inclined to not be present. We can't do corporate prayer when people aren't there, right? And that is one thing that I stand by, that you cannot grow where you will not go. You cannot grow where you will not go. A lot of us are saying, I want to pray more fervently. I want to uh, practice this a lot more, but we won't go there. We have to be present. I want to give us this scripture as we, we wrap up. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 1. This is, I think this is one of the most beautiful ways that we can describe a life of prayer. The man who wrote this is a man named Paul. Paul's near the end of his life. Every uh, history book I've ever read says that 2 Thessalonians is a book that's written near the end. So he knows that he's not going to escape this. His time is, go is, is going away. He's going to die. And this is what he says to a church. In addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Not that we're free, not that we get out of this safely. He says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored. 
just as it was with you. I need that kind of prayer life. When in, in the tightest moments of my life, in the darkest hours of my life, I am focused on seeing God move on this world, in the community, seeing people's lives change more than I am focused on myself. A lot of that comes, it comes through prayer and concert. It comes praying together. That's why Paul is able to entrust it, not to a certain person, but to a group of people, the church. I end with a challenge. It's this. Will you be committed to praying together? I mean, I know all of us pray. I know all of us have our own prayer lives, but will you be committed to be, just as Jesus' disciples were, praying together, fully expectant, ready for miracles, devoted to the fellowship, the teaching of the apostles, the breaking of bread, and prayer. This is what I think will define our church. And this is where I want to see us grow. So to wrap up, I don't think there's a better way to wrap up when you're talking about prayer than to pray. So we're going to bring our Zoom people on and we're going to open up in a second. And as we're thinking about praying together, uh, I want you to keep in mind a lot of the elements that we talked about today. Prayer in concert, which means that this, this is not a solo that we are praying together, that we all have something to contribute, whether it's a, a thank you, Jesus, or a yes, Lord, or an amen. All of us have something to give, that, that all of us are participating, that we know that we are present with one another. And we also know, as the Bible describes, that where two or more gather, although it doesn't pertain to this particular thing, the truth and the principle is the same, that the spirit of the Lord is with us as we're gathered together. That if God lives in me, he lives in you, he lives in you, he lives in you, then God is present with us. So we're going to pray, and we're going to pray together. Um, everyone online, we'd love for you to uh, be present in this prayer as well. What I'm going to do, the way that we're going to do this is, I'm going to start us off, and then whoever feels the call to pray, uh, you just jump right in, like just jump in, make it ugly, make it uh, just uh, unplanned. Don't don't be so like, OK, are they done? You know, I'm not saying over talk each other. But let the spirit lead you truly in these prayers. And then after a while, if we hear some silence, I'll wrap us up in prayer. Then after that, we're going to do reflection and response time. But I feel like we need to pray collectively together. If the Lord brings anything to your heart, let's pray it. So I'm, I'm going to ask us all to bow our heads and let's go into a time of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for time to meditate on your word and your truth. We thank you that you would give us such an example as Acts chapter 12. That in the midst of persecution and death and trouble and worry, there's a group of people who want to be in each other's presence. And they're praying together to you. Lord, I know that, that with technology and all types of things, we are blessed with the opportunity to gather together in many different places. And I pray that even at this very moment, supernaturally, you are making us a little bit like that church where we are present with one another. We are open to one another's needs and desires. That as many of us begin to pray today, we won't just pray uh, to you individually in a group, but we will pray together to you. That we will pray for each other's needs, each other's desires, each other's pains and hurts. We will pray about the things that are going on in each other's lives. Spirit of God, help us. We know, just as we said a few weeks ago, that even when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit gives us utterance. 
that, that, that the spirit uh, kind of duolingos whatever's going on in our hearts so that it makes complete sense to you, even if it doesn't make sense to us. God, empower us to be able to pray with one another and make us a people who desire, desire to pray more fervently together. So we just ask God that you would help us put it in our hearts and forgive us, God, when we become complacent. We find so many other things to do. And just put it in our hearts, God, that we have to be together to pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know all of our thoughts, our, our, our feelings, our hearts. You can read our hearts. And you, you take all of our requests, even some that aren't expressed, and you, you see those things. You are a God who sees all of these things. As many prayers as take place at one time, you never get overwhelmed. You can deal with all of these things, and you're happy to deal with all of these things. So I pray that we'll continue to lift our request to you because you are a good father who can take care of these things, that you don't get overwhelmed or intimidated. You don't get in your feelings about things that, that you are more than willing and wanting to hear from us. Make us more comfortable with not just communing, but communicating with you. Make us more comfortable and not just communicating, but communing with you. Make us more comfortable and not just communi communing and communicating with you, but communing with others and communicating with them as we communicate with you. Lord, I pray right now for Will and Grace and their beautiful children. I pray that you protect them as they're on their way uh, back home. Um, I thank you that you would give them an opportunity to parent beautiful children and uh, parent them well in such a way that they know uh, how to maneuver. And I, I pray that uh, your grace is just on them and they know that even if they had to leave early, that your presence is still with them and that they have been with your church. I pray um, for Miss Patty right now. I pray for her eyesight, Lord. 
I said, she is praying every day. She's coming to you about her eyesight. And I, I pray right now that you would heal her eyesight, that you would do a work in her. And I pray that we'll continue to come alongside her and pray about that request. I pray for uh, Becky right now. I thank you for leading her uh, into this place with Miss Patty. And I pray uh, that we'll get moments with her and, and that you've blessed her even through her being with us yesterday and today. That this season of her life that is new, uh, I pray that you're giving her many blessings in this season. And even the season that is to come, that you will teach her so much about you and herself and how you have, um, how you're writing her life story out. I pray for all of our, our sisters and brothers who are on Zoom, uh, Tammy, as she's traveling and she's preparing for a new season in her life. I pray for Nikki as, as she is walking through the season that she's in and Tim uh, as, as they are making moves in their lives and, and praying uh, to see God move in mighty ways. I pray for healing to take place in their family, uh, with their parents and with their family and, and all that's going on. I pray for my parents. Calvin and Edna right now that you'll continue to protect them uh, where they are, that you'll bring healing to our household as well, that, that you will continue to give them joy as you've given them much joy over these years. Uh, I pray for Jessica and Ebenezer and their household, their kids, that you'll continue to bless them and give them strength in these days, uh, that you will allow for them to continue to be fervent in their following of you and have great desires to serve you in mighty ways. I pray that you would heal their kids who felt a little under the weather uh, this weekend. I pray for Kim Yada uh, as she um, is, is home right now, that, that you will give her much grace and, and love and let her know that she is cared for deeply by a great father. I, I pray that you'll continue to protect her and in and, um, and the days where she might not feel well or she might uh, be uh, experiencing certain things that are different, that you will continue to encourage her. In, in everything that she she has going on. I pray for Wynn and Alan and their family uh, as they, they're going through a period of grieving that you would be with them, uh, ever present help, and that you would empower us to be alongside them. Lord, I repent right now through prayer right now that uh, of my inactivity uh, and, and being more, pre I should be more present with them in their time of grieving. And I pray that you empower all of us to be more present with them in times of grieving. I pray for Vic and Khadijah and Justice and all of their family and, and Layla. Um, although we haven't seen them, that their hearts are still, still oriented towards you, that they're, they, the compass of their hearts is still pointed towards you. And I pray that we're able to continue uh, to pray for them and be with them as they um, are walking through life with you, Lord. And all of those who belong to our family, even those who I, I have not mentioned or I have not thought of, I, I pray that you uh, know that, that we love and care for them. And I pray right now, Spirit of God, Teach us your ways that we may love them better, serve them more, walk with them more, more frequently and more fervently. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that we are just vessels. From the dust we have come, from the dust we will go. That just like this chapter in Acts 12, that we, we will see death one day, but your promise is that that we won't fully die, that we will be resting and waiting for the resurrection that will take place. Then the only reason we can say that we're family is because the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sin, that death wants us, that sin wants us, there's an enemy that wants us, but through faith, through faith we have life. And every time we get together to commune and communicate, we're reminded of the miracle that took place as Jesus would be a man nailed to a cross, looked at as dead, but he would be raised to life so that we could spend eternity with you. Thank you for that miracle. Remind us of that truth. Be with us as we attempt to live our lives in you.
with all these requests and many more that are unsaid. We pray these things together in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And amen again. So we have um, sort of a family uh, tradition that we do where we always end each of our worship gatherings with the Lord's Prayer. And if you're here in the room, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Um, and I'm actually going to call Ty up to lead us in the Lord's Prayer uh, this morning. So we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. And then after that, we'll do what we call reflection and response time. So Ty's going to come up and lead us. Can we all bow our heads and well, just read off the screen, I guess, if you don't know it. But um, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen, amen. Y'all can be seated. Um, so we, we do this thing called reflection and response. It just gives us an opportunity to reflect and respond to the message. Tammy is here. Hey, Tammy. I'm so happy to see Tammy. I promise I am. Uh, let's get our Zoom people on the screen. We'll do some reflection and response um, I don't know if anybody from here wants to start or maybe somebody online wants to start, but somebody, somebody start. Um, we talked about Acts chapter 12.